All right, folks, welcome back to the Green Pill Podcast, where we focus on making health simple for you, but more importantly, for your family, loved ones, and community. Today's guest is Lauren Bledsoe, licensed professional counselor, and our subject today is perfectionism and why it's so dangerous. As a recovering perfectionist myself, I know that the desire to be excellent and awesome and amazing in every part of my life, my body, my relationship, my health, my work, my friendships, my family life, it is exhausting. And whenever something goes well, I'm always, well, what else can I pile on my plate? What else can I do better? It's not enough. Well, there's a lot of anxiety there. There's a lot of shame. There's a lot of guilt. And in this conversation, you'll hear how to let go of some of that stuff when Lauren shares exactly what she does with her patients and how she got over perfectionist tendencies herself. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Lauren Bledsoe. All right, Lauren Bledsoe, licensed professional counselor, welcome to Green Pill. First question, will you take the green pill? Uh, I'll try it. <laughs> You'll try it? Okay, might, hopefully it'll be a good thing. So Lauren's in Woodlands, Texas, near Houston. Today we're going to focus a lot on perfectionism and how she came to treat and help people who have perfectionism qualities and tendencies. Uh, her journey is not linear and uh, touches on body image. She started out in eating disorders, if I'm right, Lauren, and uh, you know herself went through a lot of really perfect times now, but <laughs> we're going to touch on all that. So thank you for coming on. How did how did you get? into when did you decide to become a therapist actually let's start with that Ooh, it was one of those things where i since middle school i've always knew mm -hmm. i was always the friend that people came to for advice or for secrets and things like that and honestly i remember even people i didn't know well would come up to me and just share all their stuff and so it was just i don't know i i feel like i was born to do this Makes sense. So it just was even since middle school. So you must have been like 12 or 13. And you're like, I want to be a therapist, which is pretty cool. And yeah, did you know at that time, like which specialty you wanted? Did you talk about that with your family or? <clears throat> no, I didn't. I, at that point, I just had this vague idea of what a therapist was. I, I had the cliche therapy couch idea and you're we sitting and listening and just helping people with their problems but I didn't have a specific you know oh I want to work with anxiety or perfectionism it was just I just want to help people and then did anybody in your family do that or did you hear about therapy from somewhere when you were a kid or just came into your world no actually my family was worried about me becoming a therapist they they didn't know <laughs> if it would be financially stable and, and I had, up, up until I was in college, like in my bachelor's, I had never been to therapy. I'd always wanted to go. It wasn't an option for me to go, but I had always wanted to go. And I don't even remember the question anymore. <laughs> I guess what was the question? I guess, yeah, did, how'd you find out about therapy? So I guess you just want to help people. You must have heard about therapy on TV or in a book or like from someone. It was always in the back of your mind. But then what you told me is that in high school, you were pretty intense with your studies and everything. Can you, like, can you walk us through how high school was for you? <laughs> Absolutely. I, my whole life I've struggled with anxiety, but it really hit and perfectionism really hit in high school. I, I was in all these AP dual credit classes. So they were already more intense type of classes. Mm -hmm. And I would just be extremely hard on myself if I wasn't making A's. And it was mm -hmm. on the outside looking in, it was bizarre because my family, they were under the mindset of just do your best. If your best is a C, that's okay. Even if you're like, if you failed a test, it's okay. But for me, I was like, oh my gosh, I cannot get a C. I can't get a B. Um, and I would have breakdowns where I would be crying if I didn't get the grade that I thought I needed. Um, and so it was very hard and that I didn't know how to work through that. I hadn't been to therapy and I didn't know anyone who was in therapy either. And so I just kept pressuring myself, putting these really high expectations on myself that lasted 
throughout college, throughout grad school, and really I started working on that perfectionistic part of me once I became a therapist and mm. saw how it affected all these other people. The people around you, or oh, the people who are your clients, who, who became your clients. Exactly. And like in high school, like where did where do you think the expectation came from in your world? Like, I'm just curious your personal view, which I know in the clinical setting you, you're not always meant to talk about your personal view. You do, but it obviously focus on your client. But for this setting, given that your family was do your best, laissez faire, what what made you grind so hard and really pursue those A's? Do you, did you ever figure it out? I I have so a lot of times, and it's something that I've seen be a common theme with a lot of my perfectionistic clients, mm -hmm. but it was that belief of not being good enough. And so I needed that external validation to prove like, oh, okay, I'm good enough. But the problem with that is that only happens in doses. It's not this like belief that you have of being good enough, but it's, oh, I got an A. Oh, people are proud of me. I'm good enough. But then that goes away when the next test comes around that you have mm -hmm. to study for things like that. But yeah, it was just that internal cognitive belief of you're not good enough, you're not smart enough. And it, it just stemmed from there. And do you feel like going deeply into what made you not feel good enough? That could take this whole time. It could. It could. Um, I, and I think a lot of people could have a lot of different ideas of where that could stem. People talk about being the oldest child and all the mm -hmm. pressure from that. I'm, I am the oldest. I was the okay. firstborn. So that could play a role in it. Um, but really it was just, you know, it wasn't what anyone else had done. It was just an internal belief in myself. I just strived to have that, have the people around me be proud of me mm. and so I saw that the most when I was making good grades or I used to be on swim team. So if I had won something for mm -hmm. swim team, like that's when I felt, oh, people are proud of me. I need to keep doing this. I, I wasn't mm -hmm. feeling that from just everyday life. Mm -hmm. And probably when you come to your clients nowadays, you look at the reinforcement or, or lack of reinforcement or neutrality that they they got when they were kids or when they were adolescents or when they were adults. and. I can certainly echo that. And some, sometimes I feel like my family, oh, they don't pat me on the back as much as I would like at times. And I also, but then I also think the converse, I'm like, well, if they did always pat me on the back, I might be almost chasing that more in a way. And so fast forwarding from high school, like you, you were making good grades, you were on, earlier on swim team, you got into undergrad, where'd you go to undergrad? What'd you do in your undergrad? And how did perfectionism manifest there? So for undergrad, I went to Texas A&M University and I got my bachelor's in psychology. Mm -hmm. And with undergrad, I, I was obviously in classes. I had a job. I was also part of a non-Greek sorority. So I helped, like I was actually fundraising chair. I was one of the officers in the sorority. And so we, I don't know, we did fundraising type of stuff. I balanced that with a social life and with school you're quite busy yeah it, it was i was definitely busier in grad school but it was i, I was busy in in college and in my bachelor's that's actually where i also met my husband so it was also getting into meeting him and yeah also having that freedom of like leaving home going to college being away and yeah, just learning how to balance more adult life things. And, and it sounds like you managed, right? Because you're like fundraising, you got a new relationship, you're, you had a social life, and you had good grades. Like they say in college, you can either sleep, study, or party, but not all three. I don't know which of the three you got, but may, you might have gotten all three. And were you struggling still? Anxiety must have been part of your life then in undergrad with all that going on. Oh, absolutely. But you said you had therapy too. I, yes. So that was when I had first started therapy for the first time to see, I was like, I'm becoming a therapist. I need to sit in the chair and have work on my own stuff before I start to work with other people. But I was definitely the person that when you were talking about like sleep, study, partying, I wasn't like an excessive partier by any means, but it was definitely me balancing all three and just forcing myself to make everything work. I definitely think I'd I have a tendency to take too much on 
and then feel like I'm not doing enough. And that was definitely the case in my bachelor's and my master's. And so I was definitely, I guess I didn't do all three because I was sleep deprived um, <laughs> for sure. But <laughs> I, that's why I lived off of coffee and the external validation of getting good grades and told, hey, you're doing great. And how are you balancing all these things? I just, I fed off of that. From like your professors, your guidance counselors, your parents, all that, like your boyfriend at the time, all that? Exactly. It was, people would be like, oh my gosh, like, why are you doing so much? And like, how do you even have time for this? And having those, like having people be like shocked about what mm -hmm. I was taking mm -hmm. on, it was like a power boost of, oh, I'm, I'm exceeding expectations. Like I'm gaining approval. I'm doing the right thing. I totally hear you because I was the exact same way in undergrad. I finished in three years and I had oh. seven classes at some time. And one guy, I think I told you this, took me, the dean of the grad school, because I had, me being like 20, I was just very like aggressive. If I wanted to talk to somebody, I would just email them and set up a meeting. Because I'm a student, they should talk to me, I pay their bills. And uh, so I reached out to the dean of the SOM, School of Management, but he was the graduate dean. So I really had no business talking to him. And I, I was like trying to figure out what I should do next because I was graduating early. And he said, wait, you're taking seven classes, like you're taking 20 credits and you're graduating early and this and that. And you know, what he said to me, which really stuck with me, he said, you must really hate yourself, which sounds harsh. You know what I mean? But he, I think he was trying to make a point like, what are you doing, man? And uh, I've maybe since lessened that behavior a little bit of taking too much on and feeling bad about it, but I could probably use your services. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I guess undergrad, you've got all this going, you're juggling all these pies relatively successfully, grad school hits, and then you're doing the same, but you're more aware of it. So I, in grad school, Okay, first off in grad school, like I was taking more classes than what was recommended, not seven. But I was that was just one semester. Oh, a lot. Brutal. I had two part-time jobs. I had an internship. At some point during grad school, I had also gotten engaged. So, so I was planning a wedding. And so it was, I was aware that I was taking mm -hmm. on too much, but it didn't stop me. So it was this weird time where it's, I know I'm doing too much. I'm stressed out. I'm always anxious and irritable. I'm doing way too many things. I did have a professor also tell me, wow, are you like, how are you coping? And it's still just, I still felt like I wasn't doing enough. Even though I knew I was doing way more than I should, it was one of those things where it was like, I'm handling it. Mm -hmm. Even if I'm not feeling great, even if I'm always irritable and anxious and tired, I can still do it. Like I'm, I'm doing it now, so why stop? <laughs> So I, I kept going through grad school with kind of that load. And now looking back, I'm definitely asking myself like, oh my goodness, like why did you not pull back a little bit? Why weren't you engaging in some self-care or being there for yourself a little bit more? But yeah, at the time it was just self-care and all of that was on the back burner for me. It was just do everything that I could do. Do everything that you could do. So it's almost like this. Yeah, you want to keep getting those pats on the back, whether from yourself or others, almost. Like, oh, yeah, I did that, knock that down. And I guess I'm projecting a lot. So that's how I felt and sometimes so feel. And so <laughs> thank you. Good. I'm, I'm glad. Thanks for confirming. And so like you mentioned self-care and you mentioned to me that like after grad school, when you got into practice, then it started to occur to you that the people who were coming to you exhibited similar behaviors that you exhibited, although your clients early on were eating disorder and body image stuff. But as you mentioned, folks who have eating disorders are often quite obsessive about what they eat, how they look, what they don't do. And so something clicked in you with those early clients and did you start to pull back? How did you manage to start changing your own dynamic? And then we can talk about your clients too. I think what helped me was definitely seeing these same patterns in, in my clients and with helping them through their perfectionistic tendencies, it was one of those moments where it's, you know what, I need to take my own advice. Mm -hmm. I need to start doing some of these things for myself. And I also started doing a lot more research on different kind of techniques. And I think a lot of times with people who start out with going to therapy, 
you are talking with your therapist, you get advice from your therapist and internally you're thinking, oh, this is so simple. This isn't going to work for me. And so you dismiss things because a lot Mm -hmm. of the suggestions do sound pretty simple, but when they are actually put into play, when you actually get yourself to do some of these things, you can see real improvements. And I think I was under that same mindset where it was like, oh, like I know this stuff. I know it's worked with other people, but I don't know if it's going to really work for me sort of thing. But then when I forced myself to be like, okay, let's try because what I'm doing currently is not healthy and it's not working for me. So when I started diving in deeper into those deep rooted beliefs of not being good enough and questioning what is good enough, why are other people that are doing less, why do I consider them good enough, but why can't I consider myself good enough? So when I started putting into question all of these really like negative, unhealthy beliefs, I could, I started slowly unwinding some of those perfectionistic tendencies a little bit, unwinding some of that pressure I was putting on myself. I also went to, even after grad school and like becoming a therapist, I went to see a different therapist. And so I worked in therapy with her as well, really worked on self-validation rather than external validation. How can I be there for me? How can I tell myself I'm doing a good job and mean it? So it was a lot of kind of soul searching. That's what did it for you. Soul searching, like you, you opened yourself up to that soul searching journey and like a tough question I'll allow at you. Do you think you had to reach some point get to become a therapist licensed in practice to then pause? That That is a tough question. Uh, I think personally for me, I, I had to get through the grad school stuff. I had to see how much I put on my plate to see that it was not healthy because even like through high school, I knew I was putting too much pressure on myself. Same with college, but it wasn't, it wasn't that wake up call. But once I hit grad school and took on even more, that's when I started having that wake up call a little bit. And so for me personally, I think I, I did have to go through all those like really harsh expectations and like negativeness and shame that I put on myself to step back and be like, whoa, that's Mm -hmm. not great. I wouldn't want my clients doing this. I wouldn't want anyone in my life putting this on themselves. So why am I doing it to me? But I don't think it's the case for everyone. I think there are people that once it's brought to their attention, hey, you're being pretty hard on yourself, or hey, maybe let's try looking at it from this way. I think some people can step back and stop it before it gets to be too much for them. And so there's a variety of tools, modalities, reflection styles that therapists or counselor or a friend can use with folks who are hard on themselves, who are perfectionists maybe. And so it's probably a good segue to get into maybe how you work with your clients today who who might be listening right now, A, and, and, and B, like, where do you start with someone that, that comes in and says, hey, I'm having a ton of anxiety. I feel like I'm not performing at work in my relationship. I'm not showing up enough for my friends, my mom. I don't call her enough. You know, how do you start with somebody like exhibi- exhibiting those those tendencies and feeling that way? So first it's seeing where their mindset is at. And what I mean by that is, are they recognizing these behaviors and are they at the point where they're willing to put into action some of the things we discuss or are Mm -hmm. they recognizing these things but not ready to change anything yet? Mm -hmm. It's figuring out where they are in that kind of journey and going from there. If they are in that action type of step of, yeah, I know this is a problem and I want to work on it. A lot of times I will start with looking at like some of those beliefs that they're having, like that belief of not being good enough and we'll identify their specific beliefs that they're having about themselves and start to challenge that belief a little bit start to challenge all those like negative thoughts that they're having about themselves, about their performance, about how other people are viewing them and really work on that shame component because with perfectionism often in every case I've seen with perfectionism, shame is involved and shame. There's nothing good that comes from it. We don't learn from shame. We don't grow from shame. It just makes us not feel great. But I think people get confused by shame and guilt. And so 
do that yeah define them or how do you separate them yeah go ahead with guilt is a feeling that we if we did something bad we're gonna feel bad about it if i told a lie to someone that was that was a dishonest thing i'm feeling guilty about it that feeling is very normal and it's a appropriate response i did something not great so of course i'm going to feel not great about it whereas shame it's what's the word i'm looking for it can be unprecedented like it you can feel shame about things that, that there's no reason to feel shame about it would really be some of this perfectionistic stuff of oh i got a 73 on my test and i really wanted an A and I'm shaming myself and oh you're so stupid and all these things instead of coming from like that shame perspective it's rather like you would rather come from a perspective of okay I didn't get the grade I wanted but what can I do about it can I do some extra credit can I study better for the next test but come from a, a problem solving perspective rather than you you're a failure and you're stupid and just labeling yourself all these really negative labels and that's something that's pretty common with perfectionism as well is labeling yourself. So instead mm. of I failed this test, a lot of times perfectionism will tell you you're a failure. So it's not just that one instance of, yeah, oh, I you. failed this test. It's you. So it's this, it just adds on to those really negative beliefs that you have about yourself. So it's really working on learning how else can I talk to myself? Because a lot of times we've built up that habit of shaming ourselves, talking negatively. And so it's, it's breaking that habit and being like, well, how else can I talk to myself? And it doesn't have to be in this super positive kind of way. I think a lot of times people mm -hmm. think like positive affirmations and then they're like, oh, toxic positivity. And it doesn't have to be that. You don't have to go from telling yourself one second, oh, I'm so stupid to I'm the smartest person in the world. <laughs> You're not going to believe it. But rather, it's just, you can be neutral and be like, I didn't do as well as I thought I would, and I'm disappointed. Mm -hmm. That's not shaming yourself. That's not being mean to yourself. But it's also not, oh, everything's great and butterflies and you're perfect. <laughs> so it's finding and, that balance. And so negative self-talk is something you see a lot, and it often relates to shame, and it's often a pattern, right? And it's often like a way that people... I don't want to go too much into it, but it's how people hold themselves accountable almost for something that didn't go well, or is it like something that keeps them motivated? And I'm someone that does it. I, I want to use the right affirmations. I don't talk to myself negatively as much, it's, but what makes us do that? And like my therapist would say, Hey, it's just not serving you to beat yourself up. It's just, is it any better when you beat yourself up versus when you don't, does your performance change? And I'm like, I guess not. She's like, listen, if it was serving you, it's one thing, but it seems like it just serves to make you feel bad and not much else. Can you have some grace with yourself? Be kind to yourself this week. She always leaves each session with that. And the recurrence of negative self-talk, you could just say it's a pattern, but what's the pattern reinforcing? It's just a belief? Yeah, it's tough to say out of context, I know, but... It is, but it, it does. It reinforces that belief about ourselves. And if you are telling yourself so often something, you're going to believe it. If I'm constantly telling myself I'm a failure, I'm going to believe it. And a lot of times people think, oh, if I criticize myself, if I look at all these things that I did wrong, mm -hmm. I'll learn from it and I'll grow. Mm -hmm. But it's, we don't. We, like when you're shaming yourself, when you're telling yourself you're a failure and you're stupid and all these really negative things, it makes you less motivated. It just makes you feel bad about yourself. And so you're not serving yourself at all. You're not giving yourself anything but when you look at it from a neutral or positive kind of standpoint of mm -hmm. i can learn from this this is not the end of the world yes i'm disappointed but i can try to do better next time that's where more motivation comes in so you actually will change some of your behaviors and you'll see what works for you and yeah that's where we grow and so that's really what I try to shed light on in terms of negative self-talk is what you were saying with your therapist. Is this serving you? Is this helping you at all? Mm -hmm. No, then why are we doing it? Why are we mm -hmm. purposefully making ourselves feel so awful when it's mm -hmm. not doing anything for us? 
And I think you're hitting the nail on the head because you would never talk to your employee, your team member. You would never coach them that way. You suck. You failed. This was terrible. You could have done much. You would never coach people that way. I just think to myself, and you also don't want to come to this nuanced point where you're beating yourself up for beating yourself up, (laughs) which which is, oh, damn it. I have those thoughts again of me being such a such a piece of junk and now I'm having the thoughts again I can't stop having the thoughts about having the thought and then you just drive yourself up a wall but with that said let's touch on mindfulness of our thoughts and self-care because I think and I know you and I agree on this a holistic approach to 24 hours a day of nurturing oneself certainly improves one's ability to cope with stress and resilience and probably that self-talk just gets better when you're working with a patient they've come in you know that they want to change you've started to point out some things to them When do you get to the holistic stuff? How do you weave that stuff in? So that's pretty, that's, I kind of balance both of them around the same time. And so when someone comes in, I tell them, basically, we're going to be working on like changing or not changing, but working on these two areas of your life. We're going to work on changing the way you think about yourself, about the world. And that's where all those beliefs and everything that we just discussed comes into play. And then we're also going to be working on what are you doing outside of therapy? Are you taking care of yourself? Are you using coping skills? Are you doing things that you enjoy to do? Like, how are you spending your time? And while we focus on these two things, and when you're actively working on these two things, that's when you're going to see that difference in your mental health. And while we're working on challenging some beliefs, things like that, I'll also weave in some kind of coping skill talk of, or some self-care talk of what areas of your life are you not taking care of? Because a lot of times self-care people think, oh, massages and Mm -hmm. pedicures and all these like really nice things. And that can be a part of self-care, but it self-care is taking care of yourself as a whole. So Mm -hmm. not only is it pampering yourself, but it's, it's working on fixing your sleep. If you're having issues with that, it's working on exercise and eating a little bit better because all of these things affect our brain, our mood. It's working on our emotional self care of what am I doing to give myself an outlet? Can I, you know, I know a a cliche is journaling. Can I journal if that's not for me? What else can I do? Can I be creative and paint out my feelings? Or can I vent to people in my life? Can I write about it? What am I doing for my, in terms of my social life? Am I having boundaries or am I constantly being pushed around? What am I doing for my personal self-care? What are some of my goals? What can I work towards? What about just all these areas of our life? It's taking a deep look and asking ourselves, okay, am I neglecting any of these areas of my life and what can I do for me? What can I do to help balance out things a little bit better? What can I put some of my focus into that's going to be helpful to me? And like you as such a high, I'll just label you for this conversation, a high performer, right? And I'll just label myself that much. Like when I'm hearing the last 20 things you said, I'm like, oh, great. Like I can, yeah, I can optimize that one. I'm not doing so well. Do your clients jive with that? Because I could see some people I know just being like, what? I can't change my food, my sleep, my blanket, my social life, my boundaries, my painting. Is it just the the case that most of the people who come to you are like with it? No, everyone is on different Different. wavelength. And it's really, especially with those people who are like, you want me to change all these things? (laughs) In very small steps. Okay. Um, very manageable steps. And when we look at, cause I have, and this is something people could Google. There's something called a self care wheel. You can Google okay. it, you can Pinterest it. There are a bunch uh-huh. out there. And so I personally, I like to give visuals to my clients. So I'll pull mm-hmm. up the self care wheel and we'll look at all these areas of our life. And within the wheel, it gives examples of what we can do for each of these areas. So I let people pick. I'll talk about the benefits of having a well-balanced diet and things like that, but I'm not ever going to force anything on any of my clients, tell them they need to and have to work on X, Y, and Z. It's here are the things listed in that physical self-care. What do you want to start with? What, Mm. What do you think needs work? And we go from there and it's, again, those small steps. We're not going from... Okay, so you brought up how I had worked with eating disorders in the past. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't tell one of my eating disorder people who 
doesn't even who has one snack a day and that's the only mm-hmm. food i wouldn't expect them to go from one snack a day to having three meals a day because that's mm-hmm. too big of a jump that's mm-hmm. not something that they can manage we work small doses small steps to get you to where you can manage these types of things and you can manage a healthier lifestyle so yeah you do you definitely do step by step cool and you adjust to someone's capacity appropriately right because you know you have two kids just start a new job the capacity to change is just different even if the motivation is there that's cool i was curious and i'm, I'm sure you get types who can do 20 things at once because that really vibes with them and then i'm sure you get types that do one a week and they feel great about that and so it sounds like you adjust to each so interesting what else do you want to touch on as it relates to perfectionism anxiety what message do you want to get out there as we're finishing up here, because I think we've covered a lot of ground on your philosophy, your tools, the people. Is there anything, other message you want to get out there to folks? I would say a lot of times we see the problems in our lives as, oh, but I can handle it. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you don't have to handle it. Sometimes you can get help for these things. And I think the world has been better about mental health representation, but I do believe that there is still a bit of a stigma about going to therapy. And so I would just say, do not let that stigma stop you. If you feel like it could benefit you in any way, try it out. See if it's for you or not. You can always step back. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's also important to find the therapist that works for you. And so if you go to a therapist a few times and you're just not feeling it, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Try someone else out. You don't have to stick with that person. I always tell people that in the very first session because I don't want people feeling forced. Feel bad or forced. Yeah give them an right. off-ramp mm-hmm. right. and so you would say people seek help yeah absolutely seek help and you don't have to have all these like horrible problems happening mm-hmm. in your life you can go just as an outlet just to talk to someone get a second opinion or set of ears so it doesn't have to be a situation where you feel like you're just like immensely struggling and all these things it, there's different reasons to come to therapy and so if you feel like it could benefit you try it out yeah love it arm blood so thank you so much for coming on green pill um where can folks find you your site could you tell us that um your socials if any and then we'll put them in the notes as well absolutely uh so my website is good um i see right now i'm licensed in texas so i see mm-hmm. texas residents I do have a Facebook and an Instagram page as well with the username Good Insights TX. Nice. So you can find me all over there. <laughs> awesome. Perfect. Again, thank you so much for coming on. This is really informative for me personally and I think for other folks professionally. So great job. Thank you. Great, great. All right, folks. Thank you for catching my episode with Lauren Bledsoe. I hope you got a lot out of it. I hope you feel better about some of the things you've been experiencing if this really resonated with you in any domain of life. Again, work, your personal relationships, your romantic relationships, your health. Take it easy on yourself. See if you can find some moments to be kind to yourself. Can you let some things off your plate? And with that, can you have a little more satisfaction and feel better and feel healthier? If you've listened this far, you know that this is a real passion project of mine and there's nothing else I'd love to see than this grow and to talk to more interesting people and share more interesting insights with you folks. So to support that mission, I'd love it if you review this, if you share it with somebody who needs to hear this, and if you subscribe. Thanks again, and I'll see you next week on Green Pill. Green Pill.